Hello, hello. Here we are. Hey, Genevieve. Hi, it's good to be here. Welcome back to yeah. that GD show. Welcome back, Genevieve. We missed you last week. I know, I know. I missed you all so much. Um, and it, it was so good to be back. It was just a bunch of dudes talking, which is <laughs> never, never a good idea. <laughs> There's so much that's wrong with that. Uh, tonight is the final exit network show. We're going to be talking about dying tonight. What a fun subject, <laughs> but it's something we all do. And so we're trying to figure out how to do it better. I'd like to welcome our guests from the final exit network, Brian Ruder, Mary Ewart and Le Lowry Brown. How y'all doing? Good. Well, thanks for having us. Yeah. Right. Thanks for having us. Well, we're glad to have you. And, uh, I'm looking forward to, to digging in to the show tonight and talking about a very important subject, something that's obviously been on my mind for a few years. Um, we do have a different number tonight for phone calls. We've been scrambling. Um, Correa's backing up. Ethan had an emergency tonight, so he couldn't produce, and Correa jumped in, and our good friend Oz jumped in to handle the calls. So we are able to take calls, which we're very excited about because we do want to hear from you if you have thoughts or questions about what we're talking about tonight. Um, that number to call in, what is that, Genevieve? Uh, so you can call 260-226-3880. Uh, this evening, ignore the number that is in the title of the show. Um, if you call it, nobody's going to be there. <laughs> yeah, and there's a cat in the background. And, Sorry. Um, it's okay. okay. Well it's not one of mine this time. <laughs> I figured it was Genevieve's or one of her dogs. We we're really we're we're pretty laid back here, Lowry. Genevieve will have a dog crawling in her lap or a cat on her head or. And you have yeah, a there's a cat meat. cross. Oh my goodness! <laughs> just I love she's it. been out all day. As soon as I get on a meeting, boom, here she is. <laughs> well, we don't mind. We don't mind. Um, just as I said that Oz is handling the calls, I just got a note. He is evacuating the building. They have a fire alarm going off. He'll let us know when he's back. <laughs> so if you're calling and you don't get through right away, call back. We will get your call in. We do want to hear from you. 260-226-3880. Um, and you can put any questions or comments um, in the chat. And we're going to be watching that. Um, so um, also... Like and subscribe the channel if you're not already. If you're a new viewer and you like what we're doing here, because it is objectively the best show on YouTube, um, you want to subscribe to the channel and like it and share it with your friends and neighbors. Um, anyway, tonight, Final Exit Network. Um, geez, I don't even know where to start. Uh, Mary, you were the first one I connected with. Uh, with Effie and how long ago was that? If you can remember, oh, remember, I was, I was relatively new and didn't we meet up in Madison, Wisconsin, I think. Yes, we did. Yes. Yes. And had yeah. pizza and I, you must have emailed me. I don't even remember how we got in touch. Um, but we met up and <clears throat> had a shared interest, I suppose, in, in death and how it happens and how it can be a comfortable experience and we've just stayed in touch since then um <clears throat> you've been a partner with final exit network our first partner we, yeah oh yeah, yeah you were really first partner. yeah yeah, yeah. So we really value our relationship with yes you. um that's right brian i recollect a friend of mine todd yoder in nashville mm -hmm. heard about you guys shortly after my diagnosis you know i was diagnosed with als 
and uh, on February 26, 2019. And um, of course, I didn't with ALS, you don't know how long you got. They tell you three to five years. It could be a year, it could be two years. I figured I was dying next week kind of thing, you know. Um, so uh, my friends and I, we started, you know, talking about how we going to ha- how's this, you know, how are we going to do this? <laughs> how we, how's Dave going to die? Um, so I decided to die out loud. That's the name of my organization, Dying Out Loud. Um, but a friend of mine found out about Final Exit Network and he came to me and he said, hey, there's this organization called Final Exit Network that um, uh, helps in these kind of issues and helps, you know, you take control and, and have options and things like that, which we'll talk about in a minute. So I started, I looked you guys up, I connected with um, Kerry, uh, an exit guide out in California, Kerry Walker, what, help me, Kerry Perkins, no? Yes. Is that right? Yeah. We've talked a couple of times, but I haven't talked to her in a long time um so we talked about it and i got the gist of it and then so i started talking about fen in in my talks and uh on my when i would i started going on youtube shows and podcasts and so i think someone in your organization heard one of those if i'm Mm -hmm. if i'm correct Mm -hmm. and reached out to me and then connected me with you mary and then brian you and i connected shortly thereafter um but that was, gosh, th- over three years ago. Yeah, right. three, three, right. three and a half years ago. And, yeah. and I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and looking good. Uh, obviously, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't used the service yet. <laughs> We're claiming that the reason knowing us is giving you an extended life. I, you know what? It's no more preposterous than the biblical claims that I used to believe. So let's go with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Genevieve, you're, are you chatting with your friend? Did I see something there? Uh, yes. Uh, so I have a wonderful friend uh, who actually reached out to me about the Final Exit Network. Um, I want to say this was just a couple months ago because um, he uh, had noticed that you all had Dave mentioned on your website. Um, and his sister uh, was actually involved with the organization. So I invited him to join us and and uh, share a bit of his story and, and talk about her and all the things that organizations like you mean to people who are in that situation and their families. Mm-hmm. So awesome. if you'd like, we can just bring him on really quickly to share his piece. Well, let's sure. wait. Let's, let's wait just a minute. I want to, I want Brian and, um, and Mary and Lowry just each to give a brief overview of, you know, because people are being in, what the hell is the Final Exit Network? So, yeah, that is kind of uh, important to the story as and, well. And then, and by the way, thank you, Greg Markowski, our faithful supporter, 1999 Super Chat. Hi, kids. Welcome back. Genevieve, love you guys. He's there every week. Mm-hmm. And we appreciate you guys. Um, Brian, wh- give us this, this snapshot elevator pitch. What the hell is Final Exit Network? Sounds, sounds <laughs> morbid. So, so it's an 18-year-old uh, exit primarily of volunteers who uh, educate people on all of the legal uh, ways for them to manage their end days. And so our, our mission is, and we do this all free, All everybody except Mary and Lowry and one other person are volunteers. And basically what we do is we just try to keep people informed of things that they can do legally and safely to end their life if they decide that they don't want to suffer anymore. So that's sort of a very high level overview. We, I'd like to think we're really an education organization that helps people understand all the various options they have if they're suffering and, and want to die. Gotcha. So final exit is just what it sounds like. It's your final exit. It's the last, it's the last, it's exit <laughs> stage left or stage right, but it's the last thing you do. <laughs> um as a conscious person yeah so i guess trigger warning we will be talking about things like suicide and death so if that's something you're not comfortable with please you don't watch um it's just a necessary conversation with in the world i live in with a terminal disease it's it's something that has to be discussed so i appreciate us being grown-ups about it and talking about it (laughs) 
Mm-hmm. And and in fact, Dave, I'll just throw in there as well. Like, obviously, please, if this is is triggering and and like debilitatingly uncomfortable, yeah, tune out, don't watch it. But I also yeah. want to say that, you know, death is something that is around us. It's something that happens to all of us all the time, and we get really uncomfortable talking about it and thinking about it. So if you're mm-hmm. uncomfortable. Yeah. Maybe don't check out just yet, um, because I think it's important to normalize. So um, I'm not just saying this to keep people, you know, sticking around watching the show. Um, but it, it, I, that I, is, that's a good point. I, yeah, I, I would just say, Genevieve, that I think all of us feel that one of the most important things we can get for people is to have them start talking about this with their families and friends, so they can normalize it. So it isn't such a you know a, a horrible event for them. So it's one of our one of the things we think is most important. Mm-hmm. That's that's and a great point. I also find people have a thirst for talking about death. They just don't know how to start the conversation. So um, I think having us out here talking about it gives them permission, in a sense, uh, to to talk about it as well. And I also find the people I'm involved with here at Final Exit Network, uh, this sounds strange, but they're really a fun group of people. You know, we have a lot of laughs and smiles, and it's not a morbid thing at all. Yeah, I I I see that. You know, I started doing dying out loud work about three and a half years ago. Shortly after my diagnosis, I started talking about this stuff out loud um, on shows, in person, um, speaking engagements, all kinds of things. And what I found, Mary, was a lot of what you were just saying. I found that it it's like I was giving people permission to talk about this uncomfortable subject. And once I did, they really wanted to talk about it. But that but no one had, had opened the conversation before. So, you know, no one goes to a dinner party and sits down, hey, let's talk about how we're gonna die. <laughs> you know, that's that's just not how this goes. But once right. you bring it up in a in a context that makes sense which for me, my very presence, it made sense to talk about because Mm -hmm. I have a terminal disease. And so I've even taken it a step further. And in my talks, especially in person, I I typically joke about it a lot. I'll I'll do several death jokes. Um, And it's, I do it, I, I, first of all, I do it because once people laugh about something, it makes them more comfortable talking about it. And if you can get people laughing, then it eases their discomfort. But it's always funny because I'll, I'll watch the, I, I read people's faces when I'm doing a live talk. And inevitably it's like, I'm making a joke about me dying and they'll, they'll be like, Oh God, that's funny. But can I laugh? Should I laugh? And they're looking at their neighbor. <laughs> and if their neighbor's laughing, then they laugh. And, and it's like, it's like someone give me permission to laugh. Cause I really want to. <laughs> But it's true. People need need to talk about it because all of us know we're going to die. All of us know that that's coming for us sooner or later. We just don't know how to talk about it. And, and quite honestly, Dave, most of the people don't think they can do anything about it. Uh, the, the Christian religion that, that, that just sort of reflects all over this country, everybody feels that once that they start this process, there's nothing they can do about it. And, and one of the things we do is make it clear to people that they have all kinds of options to, to you know, help just, you know, eliminate some of the suffering. So, again, part of the reason we really like to join with you is you were out there talking about this and making it more normalized. And we think mm-hmm. that's really, really, really important. Mm-hmm. But I also yeah. think there's actually two layers. I mean, I think humans have a really hard time addressing death at all. Um, but we specifically address chosen death. And mm-hmm. that's one step further. And I think people, you know, for most of history, there wasn't really a need for the most part to choose your own death, but with medical advances and other things, all of a sudden people are living far longer than they want to in conditions that they find untenable. Um, and yet the medical system keeps them going and going and going. Yeah, yeah. And so we're faced with choosing mm-hmm. death in a way that, you know, hundred years ago, for the most part, people didn't have to choose. Right. Right, because we keep people al- alive too long is what we're saying. And that's an uncomfortable thing to say. But in many, many, many cases, the person, their family, everybody's ready for this to end. But no one has given them permission to end it. Mm-hmm. And it's, right. it's, they don't know that they can. They don't, if they could, they don't know how. 
And so it's, it's a terrible dilemma that a lot of people are in. Um, and don't so, you feel that society sort of frames, uh, frames it as uh, a, a giving in or something that a betrayal almost, if you don't keep fighting against You're a coward. That. You're a coward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've gotten some of that. And the, the pushback I typically get is, is the religious folks saying things like, you can't play God. And God will take you when he's good and ready. And my response to that is, is, is not, not the best maybe, but it shuts it down pretty quick <laughs> is, is, uh, well, if, if that's the best your God can do, then he's a sadistic thug uh, to keep you alive, suffering uh, long after you should have been gone. And secondly, I say, then if you're saying that to end things on your own terms is playing God, then you're going to tell me that you don't go to the doctor. You would never have elective surgery. You would never do anything to improve your uh, health, physical condition. If you do any of that, then you're playing God as much as I am. And so, that's, that shuts it down, too. So, Dave, I, I tell people that when they, I was raised Catholic and, and they tell me that we have to wait and let God do this. And I tell them, I'm just trying to hurry up a little bit and get there faster. And, and <laughs> how, how, could he, how could he hold that against me if I just want to get there quicker? So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And <laughs> we got a couple super chats. Um, Correa is good to remind me of those. We want to acknowledge those real quick. Um, there's Greg. We saw you, buddy. Thanks again. Um, 1999. We appreciate your support. And oh, Dave, I see a comment here about not fearing death so much as the being alive part. And yeah. I think. Lowry probably has had this experience talking with people that it's it's not maybe that they fear death, they've accepted death, but it's how they're going to die that is the part that's really scary. Yeah. Um, and that's your your role is as the intake coordinator. Is that cor correct, Lowry? So, so my title is client services director. Um, so I manage the exit guide program. I sort gotcha. of it's my job to make sure that we have the volunteers in place, that that all the wheels are greased. Gotcha. Um, so that we can serve people who need us. Okay, that's that's important. Jared, uh, Jared Bear, I don't fear death so much as I fear living you. You just mentioned that, Mary. Uh, I missed that last super chat, Correa. Um, yeah, we got a sure. nine ninety nine from Jeff Garrett and a Kim Possible six six six. Of course, thank you so much, Kim. Oh, our regular, you, Kim. our regular heathen. Um, there's so Jeff. Jeff's, yep, there we go. Thank you so much, Jeff. I love that y'all are having this conversation. Thank you. Yes, it is so important. And Kim said that I wish the idea of dying with dignity had been more prevalent 50 years ago when my dad was dying. Thank mm. you for your advocacy. Um, yeah, I cannot agree more. Yeah, it's a very important subject. And I really appreciate what you guys do. And I know you have a host of volunteers that keep the wheels running. Um, Mary, your experience coming into this particular field was very personal. Do you want to share a bit yes. of your story? Yes. So um, my husband, my then husband, he, he died in 2006 of ALS. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were much younger, he had a copy of Derek Humphrey's book, Final Exit. I had not heard of, you know, this movement at all. And I said to him, what's this about? And he said, uh, we're all going to die, but we can have some control over how we die if we want to. So he had always had this idea that he, if he got a terminal illness like ALS, he wouldn't probably want to linger um, and suffer too long. And then oddly, he did contract ALS and uh, Unlike your case, Dave, his was moving along really rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were living in England at the time. Um, he contacted a group there called Friends at the End. And they, um, I have to say, that experience of talking with people who would talk honestly about what was happening and who didn't say, we can't talk about this or we can't talk about that, they no question was off the table. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really freeing experience for both of us. And he decided to go to Dignitas in Switzerland. Um, and that's where he ended his life peacefully. 
And, you know, for, for me, of course, it was a tragedy, but the end was good because we had time to, to really be with one another uh, in a very honest way. And I didn't have to watch him suffer knowing that he wouldn't want to do that. Um, so that's what brought me to the movement. Right, and, right. Uh, yeah. And when that I saw the job with Final Exit, I thought, this is a way for me to give back to, to the, absolutely. Uh, the cause. Absolutely. That I watched that documentary. Uh, what's it called? Uh, the Suicide about, Tourist. The Suicide Tourist. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. where, can, where can folks find that? It's a really well done um, uh, film. I usually tell people if you Google PBS Frontline uh, Suicide Tourist, they, there's a, a page on the PBS website. It has okay. a link and you can watch the film there. So, yeah, it's and that really was well an done. Unusual, an unusual experience too. Um, he was contacted a few days actually before he went to Switzerland and uh, a director was interested in filming it. And uh, Craig saw it as a bit of activism on his part. And uh, so that's been a really interesting tool. And that, I think the film was released like in 2008, maybe. And mm -hmm. I'm still approached by people who say, oh, I just saw it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Really, yeah, yeah. So I think it's having a long-term impact. Well, that's the thing about films and things. Um they stay around forever, you know, they're, yes, they're yes. going to be there. Um, right. So people can find them. I, I have people finding my stuff weeks and months after I do it, years after I do it. And they'll reach out. Um, we got a, a net, a note from Darren Wright, I believe, who's living with Parkinson's. You get that for us, Genevieve? Yes, you can of read course. <laughs> a check. So yeah, Darren Wright, a faithful viewer. Thank you so much for your 9.99 super chat. Thank you for having this hard conversation living with Parkinson's disease. I don't know what my end may be like, but I definitely want to choose how and when I go out if I can. Peace and love to y'all. Thank you, Darren. And I might just jump in there. I, I saw a chat earlier, a question about whether we had medical aid in dying, aka made in this country, and then somebody else followed up that. Yeah, we do have a number of states here uh, that do allow for medical aid in dying, but not all states. Um, and one of the issues thinking about Parkinson's is that medical aid in dying, it's a very limited criteria for who yes. qualifies and you have to be within six months of death. Yeah. So often with some of these diseases that can progress slowly over a long period of time, it might be a long time before you before two doctors are willing to say you're within six months of death. And so we at Final Exit Network go much more by quality of life and we don't require that people be terminal and within six months of death because there's a lot of diseases out there that are horrific, such as dementia, um, that you, you don't want to go that long. Yeah. <clears throat> and ALS. Mm -hmm. And and I, I've said that often and I've, I've said that very thing, Lowry, that those laws, even in states like Oregon, I think all, almost all the states have patterned their law after the one you have in Oregon. Yeah. Um, they're so restrictive that I would never use them mm -hmm. because if I'm within six months of death, as, as, as dictated by two, two, two physicians, not just one, then my quality of life has long since passed me. Mm -hmm. I'm, right. I'm so far gone. Uh, I will never get to within six months. Mm -hmm. That's just not something I'm willing to do in terms of quality of life. It's the quality is too important to me to give that up so that I can gain a little more quantity. Mm -hmm. um, that's just mm -hmm. not a value system that I adhere to. So even the laws that we do have on the books right now are so restrictive that they're almost useless in many cases, uh, depending on the, the kind of, if you've got a rapidly advancing cancer, that's very painful uh, yeah, I could see where, where they could help someone like that. But some of these things are so slow to Lowry's point that they're all, that these laws are almost useless mm -hmm. in my and, view. And, you know, in addition to that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do <coughs> understand that, you know, when you are getting uh, medically assisted death, they do constantly check in with you to make sure that you are, you know, is it, are you sure you want to do this? You can back out at any point, but at the same time, 
you have to be in the right state of mind to be able to answer this for yourself. And so if you have a disease like dementia or Alzheimer's, then you're sort of forced to make that decision, um, from what I understand, you know, while you are still in that right frame of mind, because once you pass you that threshold, you can't. Unfortunately, there's no dementia that progresses fast enough that you would have doctors. You have to be both competent at the time of ingestion and within six months of death. And there's no dementia Not where both of those things right. go together. Yeah. No. Yeah. So it's a useless law. For dementia. So so, uh, right. Laura, you should talk about how we deal with dementia. I think I think that'd be interesting, Dave, if, if for just a second. Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask that follow up. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Well, we do we do accept applications from people with early stage dementia or advancing mild cognitive impairment, um, and so you know, for those people who really don't want to go down that path at all, um, we will work with them. We'll assign a guide to them. And so that they can choose to end their life before they have to end their life while they're still in early stage dementia, while they still have decisional capacity, because we too, you know, require that people who are choosing to end their life understand the decision that they're making. Um, but for people who don't want to slide into any form of dementia, mm -hmm. they can apply to the guide program. We also have um, on our website a supplemental advanced directive um, for dementia. And there's a number of other organizations that have ones as well that if you miss your window and you don't exit while you're still competent, you can put an addendum on your advanced directive that says, look, when I get into really advanced dementia, when I'm not showing any interest in food, don't feed me, don't give me fluids, keep me comfortable and allow me to die by voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. Right. Um, for many people, that's not ideal because you, you'd have to go through the moderate stage of dementia, but at least you can ensure that your healthcare representatives can make sure that that final tail end, which is so horrific, that you're not being spoon fed and kept alive when you're just a jiggling bunch of protoplasm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for clarifying and giving us info on that. Genevieve, since we've uh, mentioned the suicide tourist with Mary's story, let's bring your friend Pierce in now and hear his story. Fantastic. Hello, Pierce. Hello. It's so good to see you. It's really nice to see you hey, and everyone Pierce. here. Hello. Welcome to the show. Hi, Pierce. Hey, Pierce. Hello. It's good to see you, Laurie. Likewise. Yes. So tell us, uh, Genevieve, Pierce, uh, why are you here, Pierce? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, uh, I uh, went to college with Genevieve, so that's the, the connection uh, mm -hmm. to the show. But um, my sister, Tori, uh, she ended her life in January, and she was looking at a variety of programs trying to understand her options. Final Exit was one of them. Uh, she ended up going to Dignitas in Switzerland, um, but mm -hmm. she had a lot of guidance from the people at Final Exit, for which I'm very grateful. Thank you all. Wow. What was your sister dealing with, if you don't mind sharing, Pierce? Yeah, uh, it's uh, a lot to answer in that uh, there was emotional and mental health stuff. There was physical health stuff. And it's hard to say where any which thing began and the other ended. Um, and uh, some of that included depression and some of that included Lyme, which like that's uh, really complicated and intersectional mm -hmm. um, among, among other things. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How old was she? Uh, she passed at 32 or mm. 31 actually she would be 32 now. Yeah. So it sounds, it, it sounds, that um, she had what we would refer to as a constellation of issues yeah. uh, that when taken all together made her life untenable for her. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, in addition to, to, you know, your sister passing, I know that we, you know, I've talked, you know, quite a bit about grief in the last couple of years because both of us have lost parents, uh, you mm -hmm. know, fairly, fairly recently. And it is interesting when, you know, feeling that grief 
for an individual when it was their own, you know, it was of their own choosing to end their suffering. So it is, you know, I would imagine it's, it's you know, a combination of, of that sa- same sadness and that same grief and that same loss, but also, you know, a bit of like relief and gratitude, you know, because because they did have the option to die with that dignity and with that choice. Yeah, definitely. I, um, you know, the... I've felt a lot of feelings uh, when my sister passed and among them were a lot of relief. And also I was, I still am very proud of her. Um, it was not easy uh, for her to, uh, to make any of the choices that she made. Um, and especially in uh, overwhelmingly the model for uh the right to die is or the model for choosing to end your life when you can get it in a state sanctioned way is the medical model um and the it's interesting the the medical model of in so many different frames is so problematic including both the right to die movements and the disability justice movements, which are sometimes in tension with each other, and that's important to mm-hmm. name, but they, they both absolutely agree that the medical models are not something that we want. Um, and that there's uh, those things need to be uh, dismantled and resisted. And uh, yeah, at the, so all that is to say that, you know, I think about, my sister and also my mom whom I lost and like the, the ways that they passed, uh, I do feel a lot of gratitude that they got such grace, gracious, graceful exits as can be hoped for uh, currently anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was there a lot of support for your sister's decision? Did you get pushback from family members and others? Tell us about um, that. Yeah, uh, my my sister had been talking about or wanting to and talking about ending her life for a very long time, um, and there was definitely uh, mixed feelings within the uh, the the nuclear and extended family um, about that. Um, and uh, she was she played it pretty uh, close to the vest in terms of like when she made her actual plans, which mm-hmm. and getting the appointment with Dignitas took years of going through the application process. Um, and uh, Dignitas in particular, uh, they are very resistant to take anyone who is not diagnosed with a physical terminal illness. Um, and so she needed to like demonstrate a lot of uh, like her commitment to the decision and and other kinds of things in order to get accepted. Um, so uh, yeah, when when she finally got the appointment and was approved, um, she didn't tell a lot of people about it, um, and uh, I think that. You know, I, I have I've had mixed feelings about that decision, but I think that she was, you know, like it it was a judgment call. I think either one, there's no right or wrong decision there. But I, especially now looking back, I think there is a lot of wisdom in that decision. I just say that one of the things we tell everybody that I associate with as a senior guide. One of the nicest things, best things you can do for a person in this position is to accept the fact that they want to die and, and tell them it's okay, that you're willing to let them go, even if you love them. And I, I will just tell you, it's the hardest thing in the world because we all feel like if we say to somebody, I, I don't want you to die yet, you can get better or whatever, uh, it's about us, not about them. And, and I think what you did is absolutely courageous. Mm-hmm. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's a that's, that's a good point. Go ahead, Genevieve. I, yeah, no, I, I was just going to sort of add add to that as well. It's that you know when we think about you know death with dignity and and dying on your own terms for your own choice, you know that doesn't just include the actual act of dying. It's everything that leads up to it. You know, some people want to throw a party, some people want to do it in quiet and in secret. And I think that regardless of of how we feel impacted by the decisions, which is which is absolutely natural because it's our loved ones and it's, you know, we're the ones who live with the grief after they're gone. Um, it is good to remember that it, every bit of it is absolutely their, their choice and there is nothing more personal than right, than right. your own death. So that's lots it's, of acceptance. It's a tough that. thing. I'm, I'm aware, I, I'm, speaking of how we do that, I'm probably going to live stream mine because I've been dying out loud, so I might as well. We want to work with you. We want to work with you. <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> um, but I think we gotta, we'll have a live stream and you know, everybody can see me actually draw my last breath. Um, I'm just noticing actually <laughs> Greg Murkowski's comment. You know, I, I do find that life is messy and death is absolutely no different. And death is messy too. And, you know, we do spend with Final Exit Network, we do spend a reasonable amount of time talking with family members, Yeah, the close family members. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes people wrestle with what seems like maybe contradictory emotions, like you love somebody and you don't want to lose them. And somehow to say, yes, you can go feels like, do I love them if I'm saying that? Right. Oh, that's and there's good. no contradiction. There's that's they good. both. You can love somebody and say you can go. You can be confused about it and still respect their choice. It's messy and they do go together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, when my father passed away two years ago, it'll actually be two years on Saturday, you know, I and his friends who I was calling and phoning in to to say their goodbyes, um, we absolutely said it's okay because I think that it's there's no contradiction there whatsoever. I just said the same thing a couple months ago and another loved one passed. It's that if I if I told them don't go, don't go, that is an act of of my own selfishness, of my exactly. own desires that will then cause them that anxiety where they might feel internally right. if they are awake and aware enough to comprehend what I'm saying, that they're letting other people down. And that's a big burden to put on somebody. And you know, I think that even if you are not afraid of death or dying, um, it's it's easy to say that in the moment um, when you are fairly far removed, but who's to say how you'll feel in those last moments? So I think everything that we can do to make that transition peaceful and just okay, um, it's, yeah, it's, I think that there's nothing more loving than putting their needs in that moment above our own. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's tough. I mean, there's a difference between saying it's OK that you can go and saying I, I want you to go. God damn it. Go already. You're wearing me out here. Um, but I'm aware I'm acutely aware that when I do go and I, I and I do talk about this a lot because of my situation, that I'm aware that it's going to be all the people around me that love me that it's going to be hard on. Right. I'm just going to go to sleep and not wake up. There's nothing hard about that. Let's be honest. And of course, I have serious FOMO, so I'm going to put it off as long as I can. Fear of missing out. I don't want to miss anything that's going on. Um, any <laughs> no. any of the party, because I love life and I love all that life has to offer and the moments that we can get. And so um, I wanted to mention this because it's, it's a big, the ALS community is divided into, into kind of two parts, if you will. Um, not by design, it just happens to be so. Um, I had this idea when I first got diagnosed three and a half years ago that I could either focus on doing every, everything I could to stay alive, chasing after a, a possible treatment or a medical thing in other countries. And I knew of people going to China or Korea to get stem cell injections at 30,000 bucks a pop. And, and trying every new thing that came on, on the market, even if it wasn't on the market, any trial drug. I could spend my time and energy trying to stay alive, or I could spend my time and energy living. But I realized I just couldn't do both. I couldn't. I, I, it was going to be a hard balancing act to focus on both at the same time. Now, I have managed to straddle that line a bit because of Bevan, my partner, 
she's she motivates me to want to stay around longer because she's she's great and I love life with her. Um, what we've what we have focused on of late is 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 trying to find as many of the magical moments in life that are out there and going for them as much as we can. And we've been able to do that this year, uh, primarily through two different ALS organizations that that provide uh, foundational grants for people in my situation. It's kind of like a Make-A-Wish Foundation, where mm-hmm. they give people like me a, a, an adventure or a wish. What do you, you know, what what were you always wanting to do? And so you do. I say, well, I, you know, I wanted to climb, climb Mount Kilimanjaro or something. Well, we can't really help you do that because your arms and legs don't work very well. Yeah, but but it's something within reason, Dave. Come on. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do was see Europe with. I'd seen Europe, but Bevan and I couldn't go. So one group sent us to Europe. Another group sent us to uh, go scuba diving in Hawaii where I got to play with an octopus. Um, Yes, unbelievable moment. It was just one of the most surreal, beautiful, magical moments of my life. And that wasn't planned. This wasn't in in an aquarium. We were just scuba diving off the coast of Hawaii. And they found this octopus and brought it to me and it played with this octopus and he wrapped himself around my arm and my leg for like half an hour. It was unbelievable. I, I cherish that moment and that memory. Now, I can't take that to the grave with me, but the people in my life who got to enjoy that with me and vicariously watch me do that will have that memory to cherish. And we're doing a fundraiser to kind of give back. Bevan's doing a 60 at 60 uh, trail run next March. You can see a link to that fundraiser uh, on my website, daveoutloud.org. What we're doing is trying to raise money to give to ALS people who want to have an experience, an adventure, if you will. (laughs) Now, there's some controversy. I know I'm talking too long, but I wanted to get this out. (laughs) <laughs> there's there's a few people that don't like that idea. We want you to raise money for people who need equipment or people who need access to something or a wheelchair or a ramp built at their home. Well, yes, those are needs too. And we don't minimize those. And there are, in fact, organizations that help with that. There's You can get medical needs paid for by Medicare and other places that provide for those things. And those are legitimate needs, but so are the moments in my view. And for someone who's clearly dying, whose days are numbered, I find that the moments are more important. I'd rather have that than a wheelchair ramp. You know, I'll figure the wheelchair ramp out. I won't be able to figure out how to go scuba diving without uh, some assistance. That won't happen. The ramp's going to happen. It has to, if I stay alive long enough to need a wheelchair. But again, there's that option, as we're talking about tonight. So the point is, everyone has to choose what's important to them when faced with these life-ending decisions. And that's what leads us to final exit and the opportunity to make those, to to have those choices. And I know, Brian, you and Mary and I have talked before that that's really what it boils down to is choice having that choice. Yes. We don't care what choices our clients make. We just Mm -hmm. care that it is well-made and carefully considered and well-executed, whatever way they go. And and I guess what we'd like to say is that we think that we should be moving toward a model where we don't have to ask doctor's permission or we don't have to have lawyers say it's okay, that we really move toward a time when we recognize that it's our right and our ability to manage our end days if we want to, and to do it in a socially acceptable and, and, and safe way. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I do want to say that we've got the ability to take calls now. If you want to join in this conversation, if you have a question about dying, how we die, um, what final exit offers, what the restrictions are, we're going to try to cover as many of those as we can, but you can call us with that question, that comment 260 260- Two two six three eight eight zero, or put it in the chat. Um, you know, uh, 
Uh, Dave, I'd also like to just add really quickly to to this point as well, um, and also to Brian, what you said is that, you know, I hope that we have a future where not only do we not need to jump through hoops and get lawyers to decide, you know, right. what we should or shouldn't be able to do with her body, but we should also strive to have a system where there is no question if you will ever be able to afford or you should rely on an outside organization mm -hmm. for necessary things like wheelchairs and, you know, medication and care whatsoever in any capacity right. um that's super important and 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 thank you for the snap spears <laughs> yeah my, my, my radical homie um i will also say um as well it, that you know i think this is why mindfulness and intention in in general is so important because you don't want to wait until you're faced with a terminal illness or you're faced with with the prospect of, of death on the horizon to realize what is important to you and that it often is those moments it is those travels and adventures and connections that you make with others mm -hmm. um so i know that life is exhausting i mean there are there are things far worse than death in in so many different ways and it can be really easy to to disassociate and to to check out a little bit but i know that at least in my own life with how various deaths throughout the years have impacted me that's really been my biggest takeaway is is to be present and to be grateful and to to mm -hmm. lean into those connections and moments because they add up and you're gonna die eventually anyway so so enjoy it while you're here but don't you think, Dave, that you're enjoying life more now that you know that there is an end that's maybe earlier than you like, that you're you're living life more fully? Yes, more fully and more present. That's a lot of what I talk about is is not it's, it's called dying out loud, but it's really called living out. It's about living out loud and making the most of whatever time you have. I I've said this many times that it's kind of a gift I've been given, which is paradoxical to think about. But. I've been given this end date, so to speak. It's not finite. It's not certain, but there's a, pr a pretty good window of what, what I can expect here. And it has forced me, if you will, to focus on living, to focus on what matters, to focus on the moments. Whereas when we don't have that, then we just kind of drift from day to day, month to month, year to year. And we may not get around to the things that are important that do provide those moments. And so it is um, a privilege to have that basically forced upon me. You know, okay, now you, you know you're going to die sooner than you thought you were or than you expected to. We don't ever know, but we have this life expectancy, they call it, right? <laughs> um, and now that I know that, what am I doing with what I've got? You know, how am I going to finish this story? How am I going to write the final chapters? And And that has forced me to to really hone in on that and, and talk about these things and then go do these things. You know, when they asked us when we we're scuba diving, they called us that morning and said, by the way, we've got a little extra time this morning. If you want, you can jump out of a helicopter into the water. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. Why would I say no? <laughs> what? You know, Dave, I love what you just said about, you know, your story. Um, because I, I think we have finally like said to think a lot about that, that, you know, we tend to think of our lives in stories. And yeah. when you're talking about a story, the ending matters. It really it matters. It really and people does. don't want to spend the last five years in a nursing home drooling, not recognizing their loved ones. That's it's, why they want to shape their final it's chapter. It's not because... about the length of the life. It's about the quality of it. I mean, Absolutely. we can say that, but it sounds like a fucking cliche. <laughs> but it's so true. Do I, I? No one wants the last years of your life. And oftentimes the last money of your savings soaked up in a nursing home when you have no quality. You don't even know who's there. You're drooling and you can't feed yourself. And and, and dementia and Alzheimer's, it's, you're not even aware that your family's around. It's just horrible. It's just horrible. So, yes, having those choices, having those options um, so that we can choose quality over quantity is so important um but they're hard questions so what do you do how does final exit work if if i call up i know pierce you went through this you you guys looked into fen as an option for your sister um you know i know you i don't just call you lowry hey I'm, i want to die can you fit me in next thursday 
Uh, um, <laughs> 2.30, okay? <laughs> yeah. <I'm just> <laughs> um, what's the process? How does this work? And what are the pitfalls? Because everyone wonders, everyone says, well, you know, it's a slippery slope. What if Johnny gets, bro you know, Susie breaks up with Johnny. He's having a bad day. You're giving him permission to, you know. So let's talk about all those tough questions. How does it work? Um, well, let me start with the process. Um, sort of in brief, people who reach out to Final Exit Network um, will speak first with one of our volunteer coordinators who are basically like end of life librarians. They, they listen, they understand what's this person need. They will often direct them in all sorts of different directions. It is amazing how deaf ignorant we are in this country and the coordinators never know what kinds of questions they're gonna get. You know, of the people who call in with questions or might be interested, it's really only a pretty small percentage who end up being appropriate for the Exit Guide program. Mm -hmm. um, but for those people who are appropriate, we have an application process. Um, we ask them to submit a personal statement that describes what they're suffering from, what their quality of life is, and how their diagnoses impact their quality of life. To, to describe their values as it relates to end of life choice, and just to describe for us what it is they want. Um, when when you say appropriate, clear. appropriate for the program, unpack that. What does that mean? What's appropriate and not appropriate, for instance? Um, you do like tough questions. I um, do. That's what we're about so, here. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. Um, well, actually, coming back a little bit to what Genevieve um, and uh, was talking about, that the method of self-deliverance that we teach is the inert gas method. Um, it's fast, it's reliable, it's comfortable, it's well tested. Um, and I'm really sorry that my feline- No, it's is... fine. We want to see her face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're much more likely to see the other end, I'm afraid. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> we've seen the ass, now let's see the face. <laughs> but um, so there's a lot to be said that I like about using inert gas. The downside to using inert gas is that it does require a certain amount of physical ability. The yeah. tank doesn't weigh that much, but 13, 14 pounds is a stainless steel tank. You have to be able to attach a regulator. Um, and unfortunately, again, our society is so uncomfortable with the idea of choice in dying that most states have laws while choosing to end your life. Suicide in legal parlance is not illegal anywhere in the U.S. or the District of Columbia. Providing physical assistance of any kind is often illegal. Right. So we often get calls like, hey, my father's debilitated. He's bed bound with whatever. That puts us in a really tough position. It's too late, unfortunately. He's no longer physically able to do, uh, to do the method that we teach. You know, at that point, we can counsel them about voluntarily stopping eating and drinking and other paths. Maybe they qualify for medical aid to dying. I mean, there's, we certainly know all of the other options, but the guide program would no longer be appropriate in a situation I like see. that. Yeah, that, that's what I thought you meant. I mean, it's, it's uh, when I talked, when I first contacted you guys and found out what the inert gas method was, I realized, well, hell, <laughs> I won't be able to turn the knob on the tank. And, you know, I've, I've thought through this stuff, you know, will I be able, could I, could I rig the tank with a lever on it that I could push with my foot? And I probably could. Um, and, you know, I, I was thinking through ways that I could manipulate that, that particular system. Uh, but I see what, I mean, that, that is a, a problem with that particular way of exiting is that it's restrictive in terms of physical ability. The law basically mm -hmm. forces us to be biased against those people whose physical abilities, disabilities mean they can't do the process themselves, yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's illegal to help someone to yeah. end their life, but it's not illegal to mm -hmm. end your life. That's that's where I insert that joke. What are they going to do? Arrest me? And, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. See, it still gets uh, laughs. Even at dignitas, <laughs> even at dignitas, you have to be able to do it yourself. Um, and I know pill, that Craig right. had questions about: Do I have to hold the drink? No, somebody else could hold the drink, but he had to be able to swallow it. So he was afraid. Yeah, see, even with that, um, yeah, a lot of and, and ALS go, people, ALS yeah. can start in the mouth and you right. can lose the ability and to swallow very, very early on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's so a lot of problems with any that, of this. Go ahead, yeah. Mary, I'm sorry. We talk about leaving time on the table and 
you know, even in his case, although it was advancing rapidly, he did leave some time on the table because he was afraid he wouldn't be able to swallow the drink. So, But that's a great phrase, time on the table. Not a great phrase, but an interesting one. Because what quality of time mm -hmm. would that have been? I mean, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I always look at. Yeah, I may have left some days, months, years. I may, have, I may leave a year on the table, a year of existence, mm -hmm. a year of staying alive. But how much living can I do in that year? And again, it boils down to what, what am I satisfied with? I hate to make this about me, but I'm the only one among us who's got a terminal illness. So it is about me. Um, um, what, what, what do I, what constitutes the quality of life for me? And mm -hmm. I've drawn that line in the sand one or two times and moved it already. And I'll probably move it a few more times because I may come mm -hmm. down to where at one point I'm thinking, if I can't do X, Y, or Z, I'm done. But then I get to that X, Y, and Z point, And I'm thinking, you know what? It's still okay. I'm still okay with, with what I do have. And I can still do A, B, and C. So I'm going to stick around a little longer than I thought. You know, so, but having those, again, that should be my choice. Someone in the chat mm -hmm. said, this comes down to bodily autonomy, just like abortion. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. another place where we look at who's deciding what I do with my fucking life. Mm -hmm. and, and why are they getting to decide it? And, and that's what we're talking about here. Well, I think that's partly what Mary's bringing up that, you know, it's crazy that you have this law that says this is in Switzerland. Yes, he can choose to end his life at a time. All of this is good, but it's really important that he be able to swallow. Who made that rule? Right. Like we perfectly well have the technological ability <sighs> to inject the needed medication into somebody's vein. You have these funny, bizarre hurdles. What, what her, husband at the time was faced with was like he might have gone on he might have said hey i would love to hang out another week or another month there's a couple of movies i might like to see yeah but he's got this ticking thing going yeah. uh oh if i can't swallow so people end up choosing to go before they might otherwise choose to go because they know they have to have a physical ability of some sort or another mm, that's tragic and it's crazy it, it's tragic it makes me really angry <laughs> Uh, the, in regard uh, to, the kid, go ahead. <laughs> oh, go ahead, I was Mary. just going to mention, yeah, Brian and I uh, just got back from uh, the World Federation of Right to Die Societies Conference in Canada. And the Canadian law is really interesting and it's undergoing uh, some more changes. But uh, in Canada, you can either choose doctor administration or self-administration. Mm. And most people choose doctor administration because, uh, you know, for instance, if you couldn't swallow or you couldn't move, the doctor would insert an IV and that would take care of it. So uh, there can be laws that, although they're medically based, they take into account the fact that not everybody retains the ability to do all of the, the actions that they might need to do. Yeah. They, by the way, they, they also don't require you to be terminal. They require you to be foreseeable, have a foreseeable natural death. So, uh, you know, it's a very liberal law. And, and mm. in next March, they're going to actually accept people with mental illness. So uh, it's there's things happening in the world. We just happen to be one of the most backward countries in the world as it yeah. comes to death because of our Christian heritage. I think you're right, Brian. I think that undergirds. That's the undercurrent of all of this. Uh, we did have a call, but he didn't want to come on the on the phone, but he wanted us to talk about it. And I think we may already be doing it. Can the panel discuss the recent developments in regards to state to state right to die laws slash legislation? So I think we're already on that subject. Any more to add on that, you guys? I'll uh, I'll jump in now that we're getting more sure. into my own personal territory too. Um, I'm a uh, Genevieve knows I teach both social emotional learning and political economy. And a lot of what I teach is how capitalism is ruining our relationships and everything else. And uh, the way that capitalism shows up in this conversation, it, it's an interesting one in that uh, 
you know, the, the system of capitalism doesn't actually hold life sacred by any means, but you'll often mm -hmm. hear that rhetoric in order to serve its interests, um, which is just that people need to be able to do commodified labor that can then be exploited. And any way that people try to escape from that is criminalized. And one of the ways people try to escape from that is criminalized drugs. And one of the ways that people try to escape from that is dying. And there are other ways too. But uh, so you hear things like the sanctity of life when it comes to people trying to escape commodified labor. But as soon as you start talking about the death penalty, now there's no more... Uh, need to defend the sanctity of life because now that person's already imprisoned and is already performing commodified labor because every prison in this country is a is a slave camp. Um, but and then and then there uh, then then we seek retribution and punishment more than the sanctity of life. Mm -hmm. That's that's really well put, Pierce. Yes, and 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 most of the states that scream the loudest for right for uh against abortions are the ones that are screaming for the death penalty. Let's just say say the quiet part out loud. I, it's it's funny how how pro life they're not when it comes to that part, right, Pierce? Amen. So, yeah, there's a lot of out loud here. So, Dave, yeah. I I'll, I'll give a little perspective. So, Oregon has had the law longer than anybody else in the country, and it's t over 25 years now. And last year, less than one half of 1% of the people that died, died using the law because nobody knows about it. It's very, very prohibitive. If you go into the Netherlands, where they've had a law since 2002, four and a half percent of the people die using the law and they die with their, their GP. 90% of the people die with their GP because they're talking about this throughout their life. It's become more normalized. General practitioner, their doctor. Yes. General okay. practitioner, their doctor. 90% die with their doctor. And, and so we're, again, that just demonstrates that our laws are very restrictive and, and not very well known, not publicized. And they're still, even the laws are not, you know, terribly well understood. Yeah. You know, I also wonder how much of it, too, I mean, you know, everybody knows, of course, the Hippocratic Oath, you're not supposed to do any harm. Um, but then when we neglect to remember that there are things worse than death, you know, you, we find ourselves sort of like, you know, we're, we're, we're tethered to this idea, even if in practicality, it does the opposite. It causes suffering. It, it prolongs it. I mean, that was something that I considered uh, even when my father passed because, you know, he, he was perfectly healthy, but he had an accident that led to a traumatic brain injury and he was in the ICU and was brain dead. And the day that we received, you know, his final MRI and said, okay, there is nothing, there is nothing we can do. There is no hope. You know, we go in to say goodbye and, you know, we, we tell him, even if he can't hear us, that it's okay. And, you know, we pull the plug and, and, and because we don't talk about the various ways that death happens, um, you know, we weren't sure is, is that, you know, is it, is it like turning off a light switch? Like that's just done or, 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 or no, um, not at all. You know, it was, it was very difficult for my sister to be there. So she had left and, and we didn't like the idea of her walking around alone on, you know, on the streets of Baltimore and grieving on her own. And so we were like, okay, well, you know, He's going to pass soon and he's not here and she is alive and present and let's just go be together. And and we didn't think that he would be leaving him alone for very long, but it was only it was almost, you know, a little after 1030 that night that they called to say that he had passed. And, and it was that moment that I felt a lot of of anger and and you know, conflict and, and did I regret this? Because that meant that he'd spent, you know, eight hours by himself when they knew he was going to die. Why do you have a nurse sitting there, hopefully not praying over him because he would have hated that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, why couldn't they have just injected him with something that mm -hmm. would have, you know, ended his suffering then and there when we could all be present? Why, mm -hmm. why do we have to just prolong this because we can't play God. He's already dead, <laughs> but it's right. We have doctors deliver us into the world. I just don't know why doctors can't deliver us out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. I think what Brian me. touched on. Yeah, go ahead, Pierce. Uh, I, it, I'm just thinking about that case in Britain that got totally twisted by the right, both in Britain and here, uh, as a case against uh, public health care. Um, there, there was a child who had a particular type of illness. I don't know a lot of the details, but a particular type of illness that uh, the doctors where the child was living couldn't do anything for, and he, the child was going to pass pretty soon. Um, there were other doctors uh, on like a different part of the country who were willing to try an experimental treatment, um, but the the doctors who had been seeing the child all agreed that like there's nothing wrong with the treatment itself per se, but in the transportation process of getting the child there would have been one of ex such pain that it they the doctors all agreed that it would have constituted child abuse because of that transportation process. And what you ended up hearing from the right was, you know, we got death panels and they're deciding who lives and who dies and they're making these sentencing choices. Um, and you, you never heard about the fact that it would be, uh, uh, had a good argument for being legalized, illegal child abuse. Um, and so uh, there, there's a way that all those things get so twisted, like do no harm in that context. Like how, are you supposed to weigh those options as though like there's this thing called harm that is in a box that's easily identified with like, right. you know, like a big, uh, you know, warning label on it. And this is the harm box and doctors don't go in there. Um, but like other people can apparently. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and <laughs> like everything is relational and dialectical and weighing out those things means that we're engaging imperfectly because life is messy. Indeed. Yes. Well put. Mm -hmm. There's a question in this, in the chat. We, we got wonder she, her, thank you for your super chat. Um, I can foresee, uh, go ahead and read that, Genevieve. My eyes aren't as good as yours. Of course. Uh, wonder, thank you so much for $20. I can foresee my Catholic parents suffering more than they need to in the future. Any advice how to discuss this option if needed with someone religious? That is incredibly tough. That That's is tough. incredibly tough because, um, you know, with Catholicism and a lot of Christianity, they do see ending your own life as, you know, a, a big sin. It's Mortal a, sin, they call it. it. Yeah. Exactly. So I I'm Dave, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts as the perspective of an ex Christian and then of course everybody else is just I'm sure you I'm sure that you get calls from people who are religious and do have to weigh with this and struggle with it live when they're kind of going through this process. But I I have to wonder if there's any sort of way to reframe the concept so that it does align a bit more perhaps with what they might consider a a morally sound choice in the eyes of their god who uh, does not exist in my view but yeah. it's very real to them well uh, let me hear from the the uh, fen folks first what what have so, you guys dealt with in that regard well we, we we have ministers who are you know not catholics but but what i always say to catholics as a, and i don't say this facetiously God gave us a free will to choose things that we want. And if, if we use that free will to choose to hasten our death, how can that God blame us for that? So I, I do think there's rational reason why a Catholic can be can see that there are circumstances under with under which God would, you know, look the other way, so to speak. Yeah. And actually, there's a website, I think it's like Christians for VAD, Voluntary Assisted Dying, something like that, um, that, that actually does try to look at, especially medical aid and dying, and, and looking at the Bible and what the Bible does and what the Bible does not say. And the Bible doesn't actually ever, there's a number of people who end their lives in the Bible, and I don't think it's condemned in any of the places where it happens. And I'm not a biblical scholar. It's not my area of expertise. But um, Have you guys had pushback from uh, well-meaning family members, though? Um, that that are resisting these 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 ideas. Sometimes, I mean, people we've we've worked with people of all sorts of different faiths. 
most people come around to to what Brian was describing. Their relationship with their God is one of love. And mm -hmm. for people who don't feel that, they don't tend to reach out to us. Um, I did work with one gentleman who's, they were all Christian and he was still Christian, but his the relationship that he had developed with his God was a more forgiving one and, and one of wanting to care for him. And his family, I spent some time talking to them and I was actually quite touched. They came around to the place, they, they gave me a call and basically said like, look, we don't, we don't agree. We think this is a sin, but this is something he wants. And if he's gonna go do it alone, we would rather that you be with him. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. they were able to find their way through it that way and caring for him and saying, yes, we want you to be there to be with him. Um, yeah. But, you know, we do, if we run into a family that is really absolutely 100% opposed, that's very difficult for us. Yeah, I'm sure it must be if, if the if the patient, for lack of a better word, I don't know what you... Uh, client. It, client, if the client is for it, and but the religi religious family members are resisting it, it's a tough call. I mean, but at the end of the day, do you say to them with loving care, well, it's the client's decision or... Um, I mean, no, but, how do you, how do you manage that? It's a, it's a tight place for us to balance. Um, when I was discussing earlier that laws prohibit any kind of assistance, mm -hmm. where the exit guide program operates is very close to that law. Yeah. And unfortunately the position that we're in, it's very, very easy to falsely accuse a guide of providing assistance. Any family member who is angry and feels that we have stepped in, um, can easily just raise their hands and say, oh, there's no way he or she could have done that alone. Uh, so we have to be a little bit, you. Yeah. yeah. we have to be a little bit more careful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't like that because I, I tend to feel that each person's life is their own, like that yeah. it doesn't mm -hmm. belong to their family members. But those are tough, um, those are tough things. I'm sure they're, they're hard to deal with. By the it way, is, Dave, by the way, from, from my perspective, the cases that I've had were family has disagreed have not been over religious issues it's been over issues they either say their 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 parent is is depressed or uh. they don't think they should die uh, i had a case that in colorado where the son when he found out his dad had called us called the police on him and i said as long as the police are notified we can't help you can i talk to your son i called his son and i said if we were to re if someone was to remove the equipment so it looked like he died in his sleep how would you feel? He said, Oh, that would be okay. Oh my. And, and, and he, and he let the death go forward because he was concerned about the social stigma associated with him uh, make, having people think that he didn't love his dad enough or didn't want to take care of him. His dad had MS and was in really horrible shape. Mm -hmm. And yet it's a social stigma as much as it is a, a Catholic Christian stigma in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Cause it's viewed to the, most of the outside, I mean, to people view it as a suicide, correct? I mean, they, mm -hmm. so they would look at it like, you know, and there is that social stigma. Oh, my brother, my dad, my daughter committed suicide. And there's a social shame attached to that. Like right. we failed them somehow. Like the people around them should have made it better for them. And that's that's a horrible, horrible way to have to, to, to deal with. I mean, you, you Pierce, have... I've had to deal with that. Mary, you've had to deal with that. You know, when a loved one chooses to end things on their own terms in, uh, in ways or and maybe before most people would think they should or whatever, you know, people make these judgments, then it does. People do look at you, I guess. Um, uh, it's tough, but it, it's, it's not fair, but it happens. It you know, I, I think that people <laughs> struggle to to separate out the ideas that we largely have about suicide. Um, you know, where there is a crisis hotline. This is a this is a thing that will pass, and if you do it right now, you'll regret it, and it's a big, terrible mistake and and a waste of of your potential in your life. And and they can't separate that from the very nuanced difference of this is something that is very well thought out it's something that you know you're not making in crisis but you're making after lots of deliberation and mm -hmm. with jumping through lots of hoops um and i just i think it's i think it's so funny once again that we 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 struggle to 
to, you know, really wrestle with that nuance to a point where we can have more, you know, dignified laws around this in this country. But then we also are very anti-gun control because, because I mean, if you want to, if you, if you want to, uh, you know, demonize the act of suicide, then, then the, the easiest way for somebody to make a decision um, in a, in you know in crisis is if they have access to a firearm yeah and even I, beyond I, that there's there's lots of it takes a bit more planning Genevieve I think over 20,000 people a year kill themselves with guns su mm -hmm. commit suicide with guns I think it's the biggest uh, gun death statistic of all I think more more deaths by guns or suicides than yes. in, in, mm -hmm. in any other category mm -hmm. um, Genevieve we're going to grab a super chat there we got one would you grab that one for us yes of course uh, is that Zap brand again yes thank you so much uh, another faithful viewer Dave thanks for sharing your wisdom and love that you are see and that and love that you are seizing the day always important topics here that can help so many. Thanks everyone. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you Zap. Mm -hmm. By the way, that was an antichrist 666 yes. donation. So anyone on the show right now is going directly to hell after the show. <laughs> I just needed to give you fair warning. <laughs> I'll see y'all there. Okay. Yeah. We'll see you there. Right. It's going to be a big party Pierce. All, all the fun people will be there. Um, Great time. So before we run out of time, um, what are the other, uh, so if, if someone like me calls in and, and says, Hey, can you help me with my exit? And the mechanisms you have in place are not appropriate for me. It's not going to work for me. Um, what's next? I think Brian, you mentioned maybe with me or somewhere else that you guys were looking at other methods that may be in the works, anything coming that we know of anything that you can share with us. I'll let, I'll let Larry answer. She's more of an expert than I am on this, but we are looking at things. Um, well, the, certainly the method that I mentioned earlier, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, um, in some ways is the easiest and in some ways is also very difficult. It's a team sport. You've got to have support. You can't do it alone. Um, yeah. And looking for other do-it-yourself methods that are, that are faster and that don't require... Um, I mean, VSED does still require some medical intervention because it requires palliative care of some sort. Um, the Peaceful Pill Handbook, which is put out by doctors um, Nitschke and Stewart, goes through a whole bunch of other different methods. They're all difficult. Um, some inorganic salts were showing some promise for a while. Um, and I think this is an area where our society's tension or discomfort with chosen death really causes problems because for oh, us, yeah. you know, we also, we very much want people who, as Genevieve was saying, who are thinking carefully about it, who are putting their mind, who are choosing this out of self-love, not out of self-destruction. Um, we want them to have access to their choices, but that is made so difficult right now that we have to sort of put the information out there. Like here are the methods, here's how you do it because we have no other way to get it to everybody. That unfortunately means that all of that information is also accessible to those who are acting rashly, who have not had a chance to think about it, who are perhaps in a moment of despair right. and don't have the support they need. So that while sometimes the inorganic salts are starting to show some promise, as soon as something comes up and it works and it's a little bit easier, people find out about it. There's a lot of tragic suicides and it usually gets shut down. Supplies get shut down. Sources get shut down. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing happen right now. Um, I see. Yeah. So it's so it's a tough balance. But the peaceful pill is a book that has every, at least ten or fifteen different ways for you to end your life with demonstration. And and mm -hmm. uh, as as Lowry says, they're most of them are are, are not very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, I think the book they're they're going for peaceful and gentle. The inert gas method just it stood the test of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, Genevieve, you saw a question in the chat. I did, I did. And I know we, we touched have time this for it. Yeah, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Yeah, Charlene asks, how do you balance disability issues and assisted dying? Um, because they are very much interconnected. Well, I guess it depends which balance, you know, as I discussed earlier, because of the laws, the exit guide program simply cannot work with someone who doesn't have a physical ability to purchase, assemble, and operate the equipment. 
that's not our choice. It's not how we would have it, but that's just how it is. Um, if that question is more related to our application process and our criteria, Final Exit Network, we really look at quality of life. We do require medical records, but we consider you know, someone's quality of life, their ability to enjoy life, to live fully. If someone has a disability and it is really impairing their quality of life and they are suffering in term, and there's no reasonable hope of improvement, then yes, we can often work with, with individuals. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I got the question one way or the other. Yeah, I, uh, Charlene, if you could elaborate really quickly um, on that more specifically, I also sort of read it as, or at least the, the way that my Oops, we lost oh, no. Genevieve. Our train of thought just flew. <laughs> That's what you get for getting into that, Genevieve. <laughs> she, was, she was having uh, computer issues before we, hopefully she'll come back on before we uh, sign out. There you go. You were just about to say something, Genevieve. Yeah, I know. It's fantastic timing. Um, just, just quickly before, but, you know, I think if we're talking about death with dignity, just like Dave, we're talking about how you know, everybody should have wheelchairs and all the things that they need. Uh, we do need to change our disability laws overall in this country um, because you can't, we can't talk about the quality of life and whether or not it's worth it to live if we do not also do everything in our power to make life worth living for all. We would have far less suicide um, under duress if we had a more stable society where people didn't feel alone and in despair because you know it's uh, it's so difficult to just afford to live I, I i have to wonder how much more ac acceptable death with dignity would be for people who struggle with it if we did have more support um overall in those times while you're still alive i agree yeah. totally Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were in New York City recently, and I've I've had the need of a wheelchair when we're doing a lot of walking. I don't need it just moving around the house or whatever. But we noticed that navigating the streets in New York City with, you know, the millions of people there, you would think they would have some really good uh, <clears throat> disability uh, mechanisms in place, but they just don't. Uh, they have, you know, the, there's the ramps on each sidewalk for crossing the streets, but those things are so beat up and in disrepair that we found almost every time we tried to cross the street, the wheelchair was getting uh, blocked and jammed. And, um, and so it, it, it's hard uh, and they don't, it doesn't seem, there doesn't seem to be the emphasis on making life more comfortable for those with disabilities. It's just something we, we mm -hmm. seem to have given lip service to, but, and, and, and honestly, you don't really notice it until you need it something I would have never noticed beforehand. So we have to, those of us who struggle with that have to make noise so that people are paying attention to the reality of it. You know, we should have videoed me being thrown out of my wheelchair uh, at, a, at a crossing and then we could get some noise. It could go viral on YouTube or whatever, but you have to make the noise. You have to speak up. And, and these are the issues we're trying to talk about on, on this show. Like tonight, this is a very difficult topic. Uh, I, I saw some troll in the in the chat making light of it, and you know, fuck you, fighting the shade. Uh, if you're still watching, because you're a child and you can't have adult conversations with children, and we're talking about how we die in America, and you need to get a grip and quit playing around and thinking that you you can make light of this. We need to have adult conversations about this because it affects a lot of people. This is going to affect me in the very near future. What am I going to do about it? What yeah. options are there? And I'm just thankful that there are some there are some kind of options. There are there are things that I have in front of me that I'm not restricted to these archaic laws that are undergirded by uh, barbaric Christian ideals. And we've got some choices. We've got mm -hmm. some we've got some options. And I'm one that is very I'm grateful for that. So thank you, Fen, for being there on the front lines for something as important as this. Yeah, um, thanks for uh, I was just going to piggyback that gratitude and on the the note about the uh, like making these changes happen, one of the problems with the right to die movement is that the biggest advocates for the right to die don't stick around forever. 
Um, and so uh, in that way, then like the advocates, it's up to uh, the loved ones and the organizations like y'all to be the, the advocates that stick around. And for that, I, I thank you. Yeah. Amen. And back at you because family members matter. And yeah. Yeah. That was a and tough thank thing you, you went through, Pierce. This story. Yeah. Yes, Pierce. Thank you for that. Um, that was a tough thing you went through. I know it was not an easy time for your sister, or for you, or for any of your family members. Um, and and you didn't take it lightly. I know. And and you made a tough choice. Either choice would have been tough. That's the problem. There, you didn't mm -hmm. have any. You didn't have any good choices at your disposal. That's that's what we're. That's that's the dilemma we're wrestling with. Yeah, and, and Dave, I want to thank you and Genevieve because I think, as we said earlier, learning how to talk about this and having programs like this where people can see people talking about it and start to, to either feel awkward or to feel good or whatever, I, I think this is what's needed to move this forward is to get more people talking about it and realizing that we all are going to face this future and we need to do something to make it easier and more positive for people. Absolutely. Um, we put the uh, we put the link to your website in the chat. But tell us how to how to follow up. What's the best way for someone to find you and and you know what what's how do, how do we connect with you? Uh, you can go to finalexitnetwork.org, and um, we have a page on there that talks about. Uh, uh, the exit guide program and a contact form. Uh, and you also can find out about the other programs we offer, like the special, the supplemental advanced directive for dementia care and so forth. But and, it all and, starts at the website. Yeah, okay. And I was going to say, Dave, people can sign up on the website for a free membership and get our magazine. We put out a quarterly magazine with good stories and things. And it's, it's the electronic copy is free. So we encourage people to come and read more about this and see people and stories that of actual people that are in this. So thank you again. Ah, Greg, extra gift for an extra good show. Love you guys. Thank you, Greg. Wow. He's so great. <laughs> and, and would you guys agree that, I mean, would you agree that it's probably wise to go ahead and get connected with FEN? You don't know what your situation will entail. Not if, you know, I'm not saying 25 year olds need to, but don't wait until you are in a jam. There's no, there's right. no, uh, there's no reason you can't go ahead and make the connection, get signed up, registered. It's there when you need it, if you need it. Right. Right. Well, it's, it's good to be aware of options. Also, you know, as Murray's pointing people to our website under the resources menu, um, under FEN resources, there's a number of handouts I know it sounds a little hokey, but we have some handouts on discussing death, discussing death with your family, a list of our sort of favorite conversations starting, movies and articles and things. We do find, we had talked about family members earlier, don't spring this on them. It just makes it harder. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Good resources there. You've got a legal team as, as well that helps you work through legal issues in each state right. and your situation. Um, and Brian, you told me once, or maybe you did, Mary, what are the percentage of people that actually sign up with FEN that actually end up using the service? It's pretty small, right? I'll let Lowry answer that. She keeps all yeah. the numbers. And statistics. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, there's there's a, a little bit of a, a disconnect in that the service that we provide, the Exit Guide program, is free of charge and membership is not required. We want our service to be available to anybody regardless of income. Unfortunately, because of the laws, they have to buy their own equipment. We can't do that. Right. But um, but FEN membership um, would entitle you to, as Brian said, to our monthly magazine. You'd kind of know what's going on. And it's to support the movement and to support what we do. But the guide program is kind of a separate a separate thing. That, but actually using, like if I were to use this system to exit, there's, there's a charge for that or not? No. Okay. Yeah. No, our wanted, services are free of charge. I said you would have to purchase your own equipment. Right. I just wanted people to be clear on that. Yeah. Um, and I've got a, uh, also, there's a link to FEN on my website, daveoutloud.org. We've, we've partnered with you guys for years now and are very Thank proud. you. Yeah. Thank we're you. happy, happy to do that. I do talk about it a lot. Um, and I, I believe in it and I think it's a very needed service. So we're, we're glad to have you guys on the show tonight. Any final words from anyone before we, sign off here 
So thank glad you. to have the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, you're a great partner, Dave. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Appreciate well, y'all. Thank you for coming on Pierce and sharing your story. And um, I'll, I'll partner with you as long as I can. I won't always be here, but I'll stay on as long as I can. <laughs> and um, we'll we'll keep talking about these very important topics. Um, that's, that's it. We appreciate everybody coming and that's our show for tonight. Mm -hmm. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.